Welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Amanda Marcotte, and my guest today is Neil deGrasse Tyson, the famous astrophysicist and now the author of a new book called Accessory to War, The Unspoken Alliance Between Astrophysics and the Military. Welcome to Salon Talks, Neil. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you've been and along... you said you actually read this book. This is like a million pages in this book. I'm very <laughs> flattered that you would take the time. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I will confess I don't read every book of every oh, okay. author I interview, but your book uh, was important to me. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so this book is, you're, you've been a science educator and a champion of science for a while. This book, however, takes a darker, more complicated look at the relationship between scientific inquiry, which is humanistic in its value, and war, <laughs> which is very much not. Why right. did you decide to write this book? Well, I was, it, it had to do with certain life experiences I went through, where uh, it started, I, I was at a conference, a space conference, where it gathers everyone who has a stake in space interests. That would include commercial space, military space, government space, scientific space. Everybody's there in the same room. And it, coincidentally, that's when the second Gulf War broke out. Okay. And so some sessions were postponed or canceled in lieu of just putting up live streaming images from CNN of missile attacks of this invasion of Baghdad. And for every attack, they would say whose missile it was. Oh, it's a Lockheed Martin, heat-seeking, blah, 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 blah. And every time they mentioned the brand of the weapon, the company, employees who were at this conference would cheer, jump oh, up and cheer. And it was like, whoa, like, people are dying in this. Like, what's going on? And I was, I was very saddened by this. And, uh, and then I realized, wait a minute, they're just selling products to our military who's executing geopolitical um, policy established by Congress and a president who we vote for. So who am I to react this way? I, I, if I'm, if I'm going to react, it's to my fellow electorate if somehow I have some objection to this. And then I realized, because I'm old enough to have, been, have my sense of war shaped by Vietnam, and, and that was a war, by the end, nobody wanted any piece of that war. That was not a proud war, a war that we said, yeah, we're going in. No, by the end, that was not the emotion. And so I was torn between, why is it that there are these statues of proud people in uniform brandishing weapons of the, the musket or the sword? And how could that, how could anyone like war? Because I was shaped on an understanding of war through Vietnam. And then I realized, of course, in the Second World War, no one is saying we shouldn't fight. Everybody, well, nearly everybody is saying we should fight. And so I had, a, I had to evolve into this more sort of global understanding of the role of war in the history of civilization and of uh, sovereignty. So then I realized, okay, uh, my people have been involved in this, astrophysicists. No, we don't make the bombs. We don't make the napalm or the nuclear devices or anything, but we have common interests with the military. We care about multispectral imaging of dim things. And we, we, we care about navigation. We care about what the sun, moon, and stars are doing. So, does the, so did the military for a thousand years when they're building empires. How do you know where you are on Earth unless you know what the stars are doing? They all had an astronomer right here sitting right there telling them where to go and how to get there and how to get back home. So I said, there's a book in there somewhere because this relationship goes long and it goes deep. And so that started like 13 years ago. So this was 13 years in the making. And at the time I said, I'm going to write this book. And I calculated how long it would take me to finish. I got about 1,000 years. <laughs> so I said, I need a co-author. And so I found in Avis Lang, a longtime editor of my essays for Natural History magazine, who knows my writing and and she's smart and, uh, and uh, articulate. And uh, she has actually a background in art history turned science buff. So that was great. And all of our arguments about word usage, they're just fun arguments. You should eavesdrop on them someday. <laughs> but anyhow, so that's what, that's what led to this. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting because your book, like you said, it goes back thousands of years, sort of covers the huge history of the military and, and the astronomer's role in it. I think a lot of people don't see that connection until right as this book is coming out, um, Vice President Mike Pence announced that there's going to be a new military branch called Space Force. 
and it's going to be dedicated to fighting wars in space. Um, a lot of people are saying this is a waste of taxpayer money, but I wanted to get your opinion on Space Force. Well, okay, so first, it's a little odd that a Republican administration would uh, propose an expansion of government <laughs> rather than a contraction. just want to put that out there. Uh, but the, it's not as much, it's not as costly as you might think because we already have a Space Force. It's a branch of the Air Force. It's called the U.S. Space Command. They're the ones that put the GPS satellites up in orbit. GPS, the modern version of navigation that astronomers have been so deeply tapped for that expertise in, over the centuries. And so uh, what this would do is it would take all these activities from the Air Force and move it over into a separate umbrella, and that would be the Space Force. And I would, if you're going to do that, I'd throw in a couple of extra things. Throw in um, asteroid defense. How about that? Yeah. Nobody's look. Nobody's got that. Nobody's doing that now. Uh, how about uh, uh, cleaning up space debris? Because if I'm going to conduct commerce in space, I don't want loose bolts hitting my hitting my satellite as I try to conduct business. So, uh, so a space force is not a crazy. Just because it came out of Trump's mouth doesn't make it a crazy idea. You should evaluate everything on its own. And uh, not only that, the Air Force, are, are you questioning that we have an Air Force? Probably not. See, it makes complete sense. Pilots are different from infantry. Uh, the engineers that design aircraft are different from the engineers that design tanks. So of course you have a separate branch. It wasn't always separate. The Air Force used to be a branch of the Army, the Army Air Force, throughout the entire Second World War. Then people realize these are different needs, so you make a different branch. What I would say is, as we go into the future, if you want to think this way, uh, could the military use a cyber force? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, war is different. It's not, uh, arm, it's not lines of soldiers marching across borders the way it had been for so long in history. There's other ways you can disrupt the sovereignty of a nation. Uh, you can take out their satellite communication system. You can take out their their navigation system. You can so space not as a place where there's weapons, but as a place where you have reconnaissance and other things that are sensitive to war fighting. Um, there's a need to protect those assets. Um, so you. This book goes into the history of various technologies created for scientific advancement in astronomy and astrophysics like the telescope and current technologies like GPS and satellites, and really outlines how they've been adapted to war. Do you think it's inevitable that technology always gets turned to this purpose of killing people? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, but we've been, that, yes. Yes, <laughs> it's not so much that it's inevitable, because that implies that it it's, takes time to figure out how to kill somebody with it. No, the people will figure that out immediately. <laughs> immediately. And yeah, that's sad that this is, the, so it seems to be the natural state of human interaction and human um, ingenuity. But uh, I, I can tell you in my field, like I said, we don't make bombs, we make things and we care about things that, that the military also cares about that helps them uh, break stuff and kill people, right? <laughs> That's, I mean, what else does weaponry do if not that? So, so I'm, uh, so am I disturbed? For a while I was disturbed, but then I realized um, there are times you will want to protect your assets. You will want to fight a foe. If the foe does not have your health, wealth, or longevity as a priority, and they want to take that away from you, uh, what are you supposed to do, just do nothing? So my field, which is overwhelmingly uh, uh, sort of liberal anti-war, we are complicit with this, with the fact that we have this two-way street. We look over each other's picket fence. Well, what do you have for us today? <laughs> well, what did you have today? And uh, astronomy has advanced. War has advanced because of astronomy. Well, it's interesting to me because when you really talk about the technology of war, I think you're right in the sense that you have to like think about protecting your your national security, but on the flip side, and your assets as well. Yeah, and your mm -hmm. assets. But on the flip side, 
you know, if a country is technologically superior to another country, it gives them an opportunity to be colonialist and invade them and, and mistreat them and oppress them. I mean, how do you think about that particular angle of this? I think about it all the time, but in a different context. Like if aliens come to Earth, they ha they're more advanced than us because we haven't been anywhere for 40 years. If they come, and I think, wow. Why are aliens always evil in the movies? Because we think they will treat us the way we have already treated one another. So really, these aliens are mirrors to our own conduct. Because this would be a more advanced civilization encountering a less advanced civilization. It's what Columbus did. Columbus, his fourth voyage in Hispaniola, the island. He had, didn't have supplies enough to get back to, to Spain. So he asked the locals, can we give us supplies? They said, no, we only had just enough to get through to the next season. And he knew there was an eclipse coming up, a, a lunar eclipse. A week hence, and he said, if you don't give me supplies, I'm going to make the moon go away. I'm going to summon divine force and make the moon go away. And they didn't believe him. And a week later, sure enough, the moon starts going away. The supplies came like that. Oh, no. If That's you needed terrible. another reason to not like Columbus, <laughs> now you have one. Okay. Uh, and he came out halfway through the eclipse and said, uh, our God has now forgiven you, and we will return the moon back to you. Because uh, he did that at mid-eclipse. And so, of course, the eclipse unfolds at that point. So... Using knowledge and power and technology to exploit a less advanced people, uh, that's you know, one of the great tragedies of the history of civilization. Um, I'd like to think we're beyond that now and moving on. By the way, it may be that space, which has unlimited resources and energy and minerals and water and, and, and rare earth elements, all these things that we have fought wars over in the past. The exploration of space may bring a new era of civilization where the entire category of wars over limited resources would be gone because those resources become unlimited. That would be an interesting sort of uh, silver lining of this rush to know and understand space. One would hope, one would hope. In the meantime, we have limited resources, and one of the things your book talks about is how much science funding is geared towards national security priorities. What are some of the examples that really struck you of times when scientific research was shaped for better or for worse by the national security priorities? Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's really a two-way street. I, it's, it's hard to speak of it going only in one direction. Until recently, the largest telescope in the world was the Arecibo uh, radio telescope in Puerto Rico, 300 meters across. And it's the uh, largest telescope. You can detect radio signals from across the universe. A great thing for astronomy. And it's, and it's a backdrop in many movies, by the way. So uh, including the movie Contact. But um, was that funded for us? For, no, that was built because during the Cold War, 1960s Cold War, as a way to detect and distinguish actual ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, from decoys, on the premise that a decoy would leave a different signature moving through the ionosphere of Earth's atmosphere. Right. And this is a radio telescope that can detect radio signals when you move through a charged environment like the ionosphere. That's what funded it. <laughs> oh, by the way, we can discover pulsars with it and look for galaxies halfway across the universe. So in that case, the, uh, the science is piggybacking the military use of the device. It's not that the science that we're doing is being fed to the military, it's that the technology is shared. Yeah. And, and, and the most obvious of these is the moon, the mo going to the moon. We didn't go to the moon because we're explorers and we're, it's in our DNA. <laughs> DNA, got DNA right here. There's DNA, show the camera. Okay, there's the explorer gene. Is that why we went to the moon? No, it was expensive. We went because we were at war, Cold War, with the Soviet Union. And all the, all the astronauts except for one were military pilots from the uh, Air Force and the Marines and the Navy. And so, and, and well, we did send one sci scientist. Do you know when we sent that scientist? When? On the last mission. <laughs> so clearly it wasn't about that. All right? so, but so what we did instead was we trained the astronauts to do little science experiments while they were there. So we got some science done, but it piggybacked a geopolitical military motive. 
that got us there in the first place. So how can people who are watching this at home really think about how to think about a world where science is valued more than destruction and killing people? Yeah, so the two ways to think of destruction and killing people, one of them is you're doing it because you can't get along. Another one is there are evil forces in the world. Now, who judges that they're evil? That could itself be a political thing. But I think we can all agree Hitler was not good for civilization, okay? So are we going to say, well, let's not develop weapons to de defeat Hitler because it's bad to kill people? It's bad to destroy? It's, are we going to, is that what you're going to say? Because if you're going to say that, I don't know what that future means for others who would rise up who are truly sort of evil forces in the world. We know they exist. Or they're counter to the values of modern civilization, okay? of a civilized world. So do we say, no, don't have any weapons, don't have any military? What, I don't know, even know what the right funding is. Uh, our military is probably too big. Um, uh, t t it's the largest in the world by m factors. Uh, but I don't know what the right number is. Uh, so, so all I'm saying is, the military hires scientists to help them make weapons, that's not us. The astrophysicists, no, we don't make the weapons. We don't know how to make weapons. But we care about things that resonate, and they take it. And when they discover something that we need, we take it. <laughs> and <laughs> that's how it's been. Yeah. Like, that's what it is. Galileo perfects the telescope, shows the Doge of Venice. You can see enemy ships 10 times farther away in the lagoon. They buy telescopes from him. Now he can look at the sun, moon, and stars. Um, of all the scientists I think that you really write about in this book, Einstein is probably the f most famous to grapple with this issue because yes. he, his research led to the atomic bomb. Yes. What did you learn about him and his thinking on this when you were researching for this book? Well, so Einstein, I mean, he, he wrote a lot, not only scientifically but for the public. So you got a sense, you gotta, there were conduits into his thinking. Which is good, because when you want to analyze them and wonder, the, there's enough information there to, 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 to argue, <laughs> to, to, to discuss and to argue points. And uh, he was all for the bomb. Really? Yes. He wrote a letter to, to, to Roosevelt saying, we have the power, we should make the bomb, because Hitler is bad. Well, I okay. mean... <laughs> then as Hitler started getting defeated, he didn't need the bomb. But we kept making the bomb. Yeah. That's when he jumped in and said no. I didn't know that, but it makes sense. He was sense. not completely a peacenik from the beginning regarding yeah. the bomb. That's, that's all. Uh, he, he wanted to make the bomb for Hitler, not simply to destroy Hitler. He wanted to make the bomb because Hitler was researching the bomb. Yeah. He did not want Hitler to get the bomb before we did writes the letter, that launches the, the Manhattan Project. So again, this is a case where there are times when there's a time to kill and there's a time to plant and there's a time, there are times to do these things. And unlike my era, my Vietnam era, where there's no time for war, war is bad in all cases, I learned, no, that's not true. That's not true. And as a scientist, as an accomplice, as a, an accessory, <laughs> as a, uh, I, I recognize that um, that's how science has been, is, and will likely continue to be. Well, this has uh, been awesome, Neil. The, uh, the book is called Accessory to War, The Unspoken Alliance Between Astrophysics and the Military. And my guest has been Neil deGrasse Tyson, the famous astrophysicist. Thank you again for being on Salon Talks. Thanks for having me.